it's a lot of fun to be able to uh, speak with you um, this morning or this afternoon for you. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about uh, work on, on speciation uh, today or reproductive isolation. I'm really gonna focus on adaptation. Uh, so this is work that we've been doing in my lab uh, sort of for the last eight or nine years uh, on uh, environmental adaptation in house mice. And as you'll see, it uh, bears a lot of similarity to similar kinds of studies that have been done in Arabidopsis or uh, in fruit flies. So uh, some of the work that Christian Schlatterer has done is, is not unlike uh, uh, some of the work that, that we're doing in, in mice. And the, you know, the overarching goal here uh, is to try to link genotype to phenotype uh, in the context of fitness in the environment. And of course, for many of us, this is sort of the big goal of evolutionary uh, genetics in, in general. And I, you know, I think it's worth just saying at the outset that we actually have a lot of really good examples of the genetic basis of adaptation uh, that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, things like armor plating and sticklebacks or color variation in, in pocket mice. Uh, but really, all of these iconic examples involve genes of large effect. So the traits are either Mendelian or sometimes uh, oligogenic, but they're not truly uh, polygenic. Uh, and of course, most traits are polygenic and, and they're complex. And they're complex uh, in involving many genes, but also in often being influenced heavily by the environment. So height in humans is a, a classic example of that. <clears throat> So in general, I would say body size and proportions are complex adaptive traits. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today both about Bergman's rule, uh, the observation that body size is larger in cold environments, uh, and Allen's rule, uh, the observation that extremities like uh, the length of limbs or ears or tails uh, are shorter in, in cold environments. Uh, and these are both traits that are clearly controlled by many genes, and as I'll show you today, are also heavily uh, influenced by the environment. So these rules are observed in humans, as well as many other uh, uh, birds and mammals. Uh, this is body mass among indigenous people uh, versus absolute latitude. And as you can see, body mass increases as you get further from uh, at the equator. So... Uh, you know, it's worth saying that the genetic basis of complex traits is, is, is really uh, a challenging problem. Uh, and so we all know from GWAS studies results like this, uh, there are 97 loci that account for BMI in humans that have been well replicated in multiple studies. Uh, everyone can agree that these loci seem to contribute to BMI and yet collectively they only account for uh, a little over two and a half percent of the variation. Uh, in, in natural populations. Uh, so this is a, a challenging uh, problem and has led some people to suggest that it's, it's really intractable. Uh, but I think there are reasons to be more optimistic. And I just wanna touch on a few of them because th this thinking really motivates a lot of what we do. So under Fisher's geometric model of adaptation, uh, we know that mutations of small effect have a greater likelihood of, of being advantageous than mutations of large effects. So here we have two traits and the uh, circle indicates the location of a, a population. This is the optimum. And so any mutation that moves you inside the circle brings you closer to the optimum. And mutations of large effect uh, uh, will more often take you outside of the circle and therefore be deleterious. But of course, if we're further from the optimum, those so same mutations of large effect have a higher probability of being uh, beneficial. So uh, mutations of large effect uh, might be favored in situations where populations are, are far from the optimum, which is another way of saying selection might be very strong. And we have some great examples of, of that uh, in human populations, uh, genes like the couch potato gene in, in, uh, in Drosophila melanogaster, uh, or flowering time genes in, uh, in, in plants. These are all uh, uh, genes of, of major effect uh, that nonetheless can uh, contribute to traits that are highly polygenic. Similarly, in dogs, uh, a single IGF-1 allele uh, has a huge effect on, on breed size. It accounts for 15% of the variation in size within a single breed. But that same gene in humans accounts for less than 1% of the variation. So clearly this is due to strong artificial uh, selection. So Sam Yeeman wrote in a, uh, 
review paper in genetics just a few weeks ago. I thought this was um, a great paper and I encourage you to look at it. It's on the genetic basis of polygenic adaptation uh, under local adaptation. Uh, and he, he wrote that from a cursory look at some of the best studied examples of local adaptation where alleles of large effect are commonly found, we might conclude that there is little similarity between distributions of allele effect sizes for GWAS that is standing variation versus the causal drivers of adaptation. So he's basically arguing that the uh, genes that contribute uh, to standing variation and that we measure in GWAS where the traits are under strong stabilizing selection uh, have different effect sizes than, than those that we see when we map traits involved in, in adaptation. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's right. Uh, and so this is what we've become interested in. Now that we have many examples of, of the genetic basis of adaptation for simple traits, and yet we know that much of evolution involves polygenic traits, uh, I see this as really the, you know, the next important uh, problem in, in evolutionary genetics. And so we've been using house mice uh, to, to get at this because house mice are native. Um, I'm gonna focus today on the Western European house mice, mouse. Uh, Mus musculus uh, domesticus, which if you were to go right outside your door and set a trap, this is the, the subspecies of house mouse that you would catch uh, in, in Vienna. It's native to Western Europe, but has been spread around the world in association with humans in, in just the last few hundred years. And as it's been spread around the world, it's uh, encountered a whole variety of, of new environments uh, and has changed phenotypically, and as I'll show you genetically, uh, to adapt to those new environments. And so this is not unlike what we see in other invasive species like uh, Drosophila melanogaster, uh, which has been spread around the, the world as, as well. So what I'd like to do in today's talk is um, sort of, I, I, I've tried to, um, pick and choose from some recent work, uh, some published work and some unpublished work, I'll, I'll sort of take two approaches. In the first half, I wanna talk about the genetic basis of adaptation to different environments. And we're gonna start with the genotype and I'll share some of our results where we've tried to do genome scans for selection. And, and from those identify genes that might be important in particular phenotypes, so sort of linking from the genotype up to the phenotype. And then in the second half of the, the talk, I'm gonna start with the phenotype uh, and try to work down to the genotype for a couple of examples. Uh, and in particular, try to uh, show you uh, and, and emphasize the important role of the envir environment in modulating the phenotype of, of complex traits. So to do this, we've, um, we've conducted transects across North and South America, uh, as shown on the map on the left here. So uh, we've done three transects in North America where these blue dots are, a large latitudinal transect in South America, and then two altitudinal transects in the Andes from sea level to over 3000 meters uh, in Ecuador and, and Bolivia. I'm not gonna talk about those elevational transects uh, today, that work was just published a few weeks ago, I think, in, in genetics. Uh, but I will talk about these latitudinal transects. Um, and for these, we've sampled 32 populations with 10 mice per population. We collected the animals in, in the field and we sacrificed them. We took tissues and measured phenotypes in the field. Uh, and then we've done whole genome sequencing at low coverage uh, and exome sequencing at high coverage from these. And I think what makes uh, this study um, more interesting is that we've also collected live animals from the uh, locations shown with red dots here. Uh, and we've used these to create new inbred lines in the lab. And we've got about 25 lines uh, total. Uh, this was modeled a little bit after some of the work uh, that Trudy McKay and others have done in Drosophila establishing new wild uh, lines from natural populations, although our numbers are much, much smaller. Uh, and uh, we've named these lines based on the, the first three letters of the location um, from which uh, they arise. And I just want to uh, take a minute to talk about these lines uh, for the mouse geneticists in the audience, uh, because uh, 
uh, this is a new community resource that we've made available. Uh, and so the, the way we've collected these mice is each mouse is caught 500 meters away from every other mouse to avoid collecting relatives. We've paired them and then propagated them through sib sib matings uh, for many generations. Uh, we started with many more lines than we expected would survive just because of uh, in inbreeding. Uh, and we've ended up with about five lines per location, 25 lines total. Uh, and the, oh, excuse me, and the most advanced lines are um, uh, up to 32 generations now of sib sib mating. So we think they're past inbreeding depression, they breed well. Uh, and it turns out they capture a lot of uh, genetic and phenotypic variation that doesn't exist. Uh, in the classical laboratory strains of, of house mice. So uh, they've now been transferred to the Jackson Laboratory and are uh, available commercially. So you can go to their website and uh, if you're interested in using uh, more uh, uh, naturally occurring lines with more naturally occurring variation than the classical lab strains, you can, you can uh, get them there. Just to give you a feel for this, um, we're now working on a resource paper where we're sequencing the complete genomes of all of these strains, and this is not yet published, but just from the first six strains, uh, we see 14 million SNPs among those six strains. And of those 14 million, 4,800,000 of those SNPs are not present in any of the mouse uh, genomes uh, 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 that, that uh, have been sequenced so far. So we think that these strains capture uh, a, a very large proportion of, of variation that's not uh, present among existing strains. And if we just look at highly deleterious SNPs, uh, there are an even higher proportion uh, that are not captured among existing strains. So we think these are gonna be uh, good models for a lot of human diseases. Uh, we're phenotyping them in conjunction with folks at the uh, Jackson Lab in a, a standard battery of phenotyping uh, uh, approaches that are used in mice. I'm not going to go through this now, but I, I, I do just want to say uh, two overarching themes have emerged. First, nearly everything is variable. So these strains really are uh, remarkably uh, variable and different from existing strains. And in general, strains from the same location appear to be more phenotypically similar to each other than to strains from, from different locations. So if you're a mouse geneticist, uh, I encourage you to look at these strains. Okay, so what are some of those phenotypic differences? Um, back, back to evolution here. Uh, if we compare mice from Brazil, so these are mice taken from right near the equator, uh, with mice from Florida or mice from uh, New York. And this is not New York City. This is upstate New York uh, at about 45 degrees north latitude. And we just measure body weight in the wild animals. You can see that the mice from higher latitudes are larger than the mice from lower latitudes. And, and this difference uh, is, is quite substantial. So these mice from New York, and you can see it in these photos here, uh, are about 50% bigger than these mice uh, from Brazil. If you bring them into the lab and, and keep them for a number of generations, uh, first of all, they get bigger in the lab with unlimited food. Uh, so you can see some plasticity there, uh, but the differences between populations uh, persist indicating that they are uh, genetically uh, determined. So we like to think of these as our cold adapted and uh, warm adapted uh, mice. And uh, if you just hold them in, in, in the hand, you can immediately see differences between them. Uh, and the interesting thing from an evolutionary perspective is that these differences have arisen in just a few hundred generations. So the, the first uh, museum records of mice in the Americas come from the early 1800s. Uh, most likely mice have been here uh, since before then, uh, but these mice breed uh, at most a couple of times a year. So it's really just a few hundred generations. And yet we see substantial differences uh, in phenotypes. Uh, so the mice conform to Bergman's rule. They also conform to Allen's rule. So we see differences in ear size. So mice from the equator have big ears like Mickey Mouse and Mice from 45 uh, degrees north latitude uh, have small ears, uh, and they also differ in, in, in tail size. And again, these differences persist in the lab. So uh, 
let me show you some of this, uh, the genome scans that we've done to try to find genes that we think might underlie those and, and other traits. And this is work that was done by uh, a former postdoc in my lab, Megan pfeiffer Rixey. And so she, I'm just going to begin by focusing on these five populations in Eastern North America and include these two triangles, which are, are the locations from the ends of the transect where we have uh, live animals. Um, and uh, just to set the stage a little more, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I want to mention that we've measured a variety of phenotypes in those uh, descendants of wild-caught animal in the lab, including many aspects of, of blood chemistry. And as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, we see differences in, in almost anything that we measure. So we see higher adiponectin and lower leptin uh, levels in New York compared to Florida. Uh, differences in glucose levels uh, between cold adapted and warm adapted mice. Uh, mice from colder environments build larger nests than mice from warmer in environments. Whoops. Uh, and uh, that's in, in, in a lab at, at 20 degrees Celsius. So they're, they're not faced with any, any uh, uh, thermoregulatory challenge and yet they build larger nests and this difference uh, persists over many generations. And so it seems to be genetically based. Uh, the assay that we do for this is very simple. We uh, put cotton in the top of the hopper and uh, just measure how much cotton they pull down in, in 24 hours. Uh, and as you can see, um, New York mouse makes a giant nest uh, as shown on the left uh, and the Florida mice make a much, much smaller nest. Uh, the Brazil mice often just sit on top of their cotton. So there are big, big differences. Uh, New York mice are also more active uh, than Florida mice. So this is just a, a wheel running assay. Okay, so those are some of the phenotypes, uh, but the uh, interest in genome scans or part of the interest in genome scans uh, is that we can uh, query the genome and be sort of agnostic with respect to phenotype, identify genes that show signatures of selection and let the genome tell us uh, what traits might be important. Now we see differences in, in body size and proportions as I just showed you, but perhaps there are other traits that we haven't thought about uh, that are nonetheless under, under selection. So uh, we identified about 280,000 SNPs uh, from these exome data in 19,000 genes. And we used uh, this latent factor mixed model, um, which is an approach that looks for correlations between genotypes and environmental variables while taking into, the into account uh, the correlated history of, of uh, populations. And then we also just did this simple thing of looking at, at genes that show clinal patterns in allele frequency. Um, so just to give you a feel for the data, if you do a, a principal component analysis of all the SNPs, the populations hold together. So these are all unrelated individuals, uh, and yet each population uh, is distinct from all the other populations. Uh, if we compare differentiation among populations with geographic distance, uh, we don't see a correlation. So it doesn't look, for example, like uh, across the eastern seaboard of North America, there are strong uh, patterns of clinal variation. There aren't. Uh, most genes don't show that. And so the few that do really, really stand out. And that uh, that's, helps in identifying genes that might be under selection. Okay, so uh, what do uh, those genes look like? Well, here's sort of a typical example, melanocortin-3 receptor. What I'm showing you are correlation uh, coefficients between particular SNPs and latitude. Uh, and you can see in this one gene, uh, there's this peak of, uh, uh, of um, correlation coefficients. So these are SNPs that, that vary clinally. And if you look at the genes immediately upstream and downstream, uh, that signal decays very, very rapidly. So it localizes uh, to individual genes. And in general, that uh, is the pattern that we see. We don't typically see very long haplotype blocks of megabases that show signatures of selection. And we think this is consistent with the idea that most selection is acting on standing uh, variation. Uh, we see signatures in multiple transects, and I'll show you that in a, in a, 
in a, in a minute. Uh, in this gene, and in, in fact, in most genes, uh, the clinal SNPs that we see tend to be in introns or at synonymous sites, but not at non-synonymous sites. Uh, and for this gene, uh, there are many phenotypes that are, have been identified in lab mice uh, that uh, are similar to the differences that we see among these populations. So we see signatures of selection at this gene. We can take advantage of the extremely detailed uh, lab mouse mutant database uh, and ask whether uh, it's known to be associated with some of the phenotypes that we see as distinguishing populations. And the answer is, is yes. So we think that this is a, a strong uh, candidate gene. As I just said, uh, uh, most of the, the SNPs that we identify are not non-synonymous. Uh, and this suggests that uh, much of adaptation might be driven by changes in gene regulation rather than by changes in, in protein structure. Okay, so we can do that and come up with uh, a whole set of, of uh, candidate genes. But of course, when one applies these sorts of genome scans for selection, depending on what significance thresholds you use, uh, you may identify hundreds or even thousands of genes. Uh, and so we'd like to be able to narrow that list and try to connect those genes with phenotypes. So to do that, um, we've, in, for the same set of 50 mice, uh, uh, performed RNA-seq on the wild-caught animals uh, from liver tissue, because liver is an important tissue for metabolic phenotypes. And we've looked for clinal patterns of expression variation. We've identified cis-EQTL through associations with SNPs, and then we verified those cis EQTL using allele specific patterns of expression uh, in, in heterozygotes. And so the idea here is that we're using expression as sort of an intermediate phenotype to connect uh, uh, patterns of genetic variation with more organismal phenotypes. So we're looking for the overlap between uh, what we find in genome scans for selection those genes that show clines in gene expression, and then those where the control of expression seems to be at or near the gene itself. And so there are plenty of genes that show clines in gene expression, but of course, if they're controlled in trans, we don't expect any overlap uh, between that gene and the, the genome scans uh, for selection. It's only for those genes where the control is local that we expect overlap. So when we overlap those three criteria, uh, we find only 17 genes. And that's shown here with these overlapping Manhattan plots. Oops. Uh, the 17 genes are, uh, are on the outside of this, this circle. Uh, and so we've, we've gone from a situation where we have hundreds of genes to a, a, a much more manageable uh, number. Uh, and then uh, we've overlaid uh, that set of 17 genes with uh, mutants known from laboratory mice. And when we do that, there are just six genes that lie in the intersection of those uh, uh, four criteria. That is genes that, uh, in addition to showing clinal patterns of gene expression, signals of selection, and cis-EQTL, are associated with phenotypes in lab mice that seem to be uh, different between uh, our mice from the ends of the transect. And I'm just going to talk about this top one uh, to give you a feel for, for what this looks like. So this is a gene that's associated with body mass in lab mouse mutants. So uh, this gene is a ADAM17. It's a transmembrane protein uh, that plays a role in the release uh, of cytokines and growth factors and, and their receptors. So this is just showing among wild mice, um, the expression of that gene normalized uh, to latitude. So as we go to higher latitudes, the gene is expressed at lower levels. Um, there is a cis-EQTL uh, controlling that gene. So here are the genotypes of that SNP. And as you can see, uh, it's associated with different uh, levels of expression. That SNP shows clinal patterns of variation and shows up in our genome scan for selection. If we now correlate the residuals of body mass 
and these are residuals taking latitude into account versus expression of that gene, we see uh, that the expression of that gene is associated with body mass. And finally, that cis EQTL is associated with, with body mass. Uh, so we think that this is a gene that uh, is associated with body mass in natural populations. Uh, this gene together with the second gene that I mentioned, uh, uh, those two genes together account for about 10% of the phenotypic variance in body mass among mice from Eastern North America. So we think that you, starting with the genome scan, we've identified genes uh, that are important in, uh, in this case, in Bergman's rule. So in a highly polygenic trait, uh, but together they're explaining a, you know, a substantial amount of, of the variation. The same gene, ADAM17, is associated with birth weight and adult height uh, in human GWAS, but accounts for less than 1% of the variation. So this goes back to what I was saying at the outset, this difference between uh, what we see from GWAS when we look at traits under uh, stabilizing selection versus what we see when we look at traits that we think have been under very strong directional selection. Uh, and again, 97 loci in humans only account for two and a half percent of the variation in BMI. So uh, this is a, a very different situation from what one finds um, with, uh, with uh, human GWAS. Well, next, we were interested in asking whether we see similar patterns uh, if we compare two transects or three transects. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is just compare Western North America with uh, Eastern North America. Um, the phylogeny of the populations is shown on the right. And uh, what we see in this phylogeny are two major clades, one in the East, one in the West. So there's no evidence from the phylogeny that mice in cold places in Canada have arisen from mice, uh, for example, in cold places in the, in the East. Uh, instead, it looks like mice have independently colonized cold environments in the East and in the West. <coughs> Excuse me. If we look uh, at mice from the ends of those transects uh, in the lab, we see similar differences in both body weight and nest weight. So mice from cold places uh, uh, in, in Canada compared to Arizona uh, are larger and build bigger nests, just as they do in, in, the, uh, in the east. If we now ask whether there's overlap uh, in uh, uh, the uh, genome in the candidate genes identified from genome scans for selection, uh, by and large, we see distinct responses to selection in each transect. Uh, and so this is certainly consistent with a polygenic basis to, to the traits. <clears throat> um, nonetheless, there is um, more overlap than expected by chance. So there is significant overlap uh, of selection uh, signals. Uh, and some of those overlapping genes are of uh, particular interest. Uh, and let me just point to one example here because this is a, a good example of a gene that we were not expecting uh, when we went into this study, but has sort of emerged from this agnostic uh, look at, at, uh, at the genome. So when we look for overlap, between all three transects shown here, that is the two in North America and this one latitudinal transect in, in South America, uh, there are a lot of genes that, that overlap and among them are these uh, two TRPM receptors. So these are uh, uh, two receptors that are involved in sensing uh, uh, temperature, heat and cold. Uh, and they've been in the news a lot lately because the Nobel, the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded uh, for the discovery of these and, and related uh, genes. Uh, and this is, this is exciting for us because um, we weren't thinking about them when we started this study. And uh, it turns out that there are very simple assays in mice that one can do uh, to um, assess function. So uh, the assays, and we're start, just starting to, to think about, we haven't done these yet, we're just starting to think about these, but uh, there, one can put a mouse in a chamber uh, with different temperature substrates and record uh, 
uh, how long it takes for them to uh, respond to hot temperatures or, or uh, cold temperatures. And so we, of course, we have mice that have evolved in these different environments and we can start to look at uh, receptor function both in whole organisms and, and then in, in, uh, uh, in vitro and cell culture assays. So I remain a, a, a big fan of these scans for selection because they can lead us to phenotypes that we hadn't uh, otherwise uh, thought about. And um, that's motivating some of our, our ongoing work. Okay, that's sort of the first half. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time since we started uh, late here. But now I want to turn to um, the flip side where we start with phenotypes and try to work down to the genotype. Uh, and I want to focus on uh, traits uh, where we've uh, tried to assess the role of the environment in modulating the expression of those traits. And this is motivated by thinking about how adaptation works for traits that exhibit some plasticity. So if we, we go back to this model from Fisher, but think about... Uh, moving towards the optimum, both in terms of plasticity and, and genetic changes. Plasticity can be adaptive if it moves an organism closer to the optimum uh, in its new environment. And then selection can uh, further bring the organism closer to, to the optimum. Um, if plasticity is extreme, it might bring the organism all the way to the optimum uh, and in that case, it's removed entirely any selection pressure for further genetic uh, change. Conversely, plasticity can be non-adaptive if it moves an organism further from the optimum in a new environment, uh, and then selection uh, must uh, act uh, to, to uh, bring an organism much closer to, uh, to the optimum. And so we were interested in just asking how often is plasticity adaptive and how often is it, is it non-adaptive? Uh, and I guess it's, it's worth pointing out that there are great examples of both of these uh, in the recent literature. So this is uh, work from uh, Cameron Gallimbor and, and uh, David uh, Resnick and, and Kim Hughes on guppies. Uh, and so this is gene expression in the brain uh, in response to environments with and without predators. You bring them into the lab and expose them to predators or not. And you see that most changes in gene expression go in the opposite direction of uh, the adaptive difference between populations. So that's an example of non-adaptive plasticity. Uh, conversely, this work by Amon Coral and Rasmus Nielsen and, and uh, Barry Sinervo uh, on color variation in lizards is an example of adaptive plasticity. So these lizards show genetic changes that make them match the substrates on, on, on which they live. But it turns out if you take a, a, a dark lizard and you just put it on light colored uh, sand, it changes color and it takes uh, four months to completely change, but there is plasticity there. Uh, and in this case, the genetic change and the, and the plastic response go in the same direction. So we were interested in asking for our mice, first of all, whether we see plasticity, and second of all, if we do, does it go in, in an adaptive or a non-adaptive uh, direction? And so uh, I'm gonna focus on two separate studies. The first is on tail length and body size, and the second is on water consumption. Um, so here's, here's the situation, if we just, go to museum collections uh, and download all of the data uh, from museum collections on body mass as a function of latitude and ask whether there's a correlation. This is just showing um, for adult males uh, where we've curated the data well, we're sure these are adults, uh, the locality information is, is, is uh, uh, correct. Uh, and what we see is that there is a correlation, as I showed you for, for our mice in, in first part of the talk, between body mass and, and latitude. Um, and this is both in the northern and southern hemisphere. So this is just the degrees from the equator. And there's uh, also a, a negative correlation between relative tail length and, and latitude. So as you get further from the equator, uh, tails get, get shorter. <clears throat> But the, you know, the, there are a couple of things to notice here. The, the first is that there's a lot of scatter. Uh, so while we see these correlations, uh, 
uh, there is a tremendous amount of variation. Now, these are all collected by different people and measured by different people. So there's probably some experimental uh, variation there. Um, but uh, even ignoring that, there's a lot of variation at individual latitudes. And, and so we'd like to know how much of this is genetic uh, and how much is due to the environment. And uh, so often in the literature, when you read about Bergman's rule and Allen's rule, this, there's this sort of implicit assumption uh, that because uh, you see it in many different species, it must, it must be genetic and, and reflect adaptation. But if you, if you go back and read, for example, Allen's uh, paper from the, 19, uh, from the 1800s, uh, he actually emphasizes the direct role of the environment that is phenotypic plasticity in, in generating this, uh, this pattern. So, so we were interested in, in trying to get at that. Uh, and this was work done by a former graduate student in the lab, Mallory Ballinger. <clears throat> and what she did is uh, something that's commonly done in, in plants uh, and less commonly done in animals, but has been done in quite a few different systems, most notably probably Drosophila, is to bring the animals into a common lab environment. This isn't done so much in, in mammals. It's just a, a a harder experiment to do. But we bring them into the lab, we keep them for many generations. And the first thing we can ask is, uh, well, what does heritability look like? So we've measured heritability by looking at um, the regression um, uh, of, from offspring on the mid-parent body mass. And this is for uh, body mass and relative tail length for mice from New York and from Brazil. Uh, and this is after several generations in the lab. And what we see is that heritabilities are, are moderately high as seen for other polygenic traits. So around 50%, <clears throat> suggesting that there's a, a strong genetic component. And then the other simple thing we can do is just ask uh, after many generations, do you see a difference in the lab? I'm showing you here just relative tail length and the answer is, is yes. So without question, uh, there's a genetic basis uh, to these differences. But this still doesn't tell us if there's also some sort of plastic response. Uh, I'll show you that in a sec, but let me uh, also mention that we're, we're trying to get at the underlying genes for some of these differences uh, directly through QTL mapping. Uh, and so uh, we've made a large mapping population by crossing Brazil and New York mice. We've got about 450 individuals in this F3 mapping population, and we're looking at lots of traits uh, this is uh, preliminary data, but I'm just showing you here uh, the results uh, for um, relative tail length. And uh, there are seven genomic regions that are identified uh, as shown uh, here. And encouragingly, uh, these contain some sort of classic uh, tail length mutants known from laboratory mice like HOXB13 and LIN28. So we're now trying to narrow down these QTL intervals. Uh, of course, the challenge with QTL mapping is that these intervals are fairly wide. Uh, so they span megabases and contain dozens or sometimes hundreds of genes. Uh, and so to narrow the intervals, we're looking at expression in the developing tail uh, in, in the parents and also uh, in F1 hybrids so that we can identify SISI QTL. Uh, and um, I'm not going to present any of that work right now. That's ongoing, and we're, we don't yet have uh, uh, results that, are, that I can I talk about, uh, other than to say some of these genes are, are exciting, and we think that we're going to be able to get to the genes underlying tail length differences. Um, okay, but as I said, uh, knowing that there's a strong genetic component still doesn't tell us if there's also a plastic component. And then, so to get at that, what we need to do is compare uh, mice in two different environments. So here, uh, we brought them into the lab and in a full sieve design, we're rearing mice at, at four degrees and at 20 degrees uh, and looking at both whole organism phenotypes and gene expression. So what does this look like? Um, Females are on the left, males are on the right. This is body mass as a function of age from weaning at three weeks up to 11 weeks. The blue colors are um, the New York uh, animals from the blue for cold. Uh, the yellow colors are mice from Brazil for the uh, warm. And so you can see at 11 weeks, as I've shown you in a few different ways now, 
the New York mice are larger than the Brazil mice. If you keep them in the cold, as shown by this dashed line, there's not a big difference in, in body size. Uh, so we don't see a lot of phenotypic plasticity for body size, either for females uh, or for males. Now, uh, their, their uh, fat content, especially brown adipose tissue, goes up a lot. Uh, their food consumption goes up a, a huge amount, uh, but their body size doesn't, doesn't change much. In contrast, if we uh, measure tail length, we see a large effect. So I'm showing you absolute tail length rather than le uh, relative tail length to give you a, a feel for the size of the phenotype. If I showed you relative tail length, the effect is even uh, bigger. Uh, but the thing to see first is that uh, the Brazil mice have longer tails at room temperature than the New York mice as shown by this difference. But now if you take a Brazil mouse and you raise it in the cold shown here, its tail is much shorter. And you can see how much shorter over here, you know, this is a difference of, oh, you know, maybe 8% eight, eight of the, the total length of the, the tail. So it's a non-trivial difference. And that's seen for both uh, New York and, and Brazil mice. Another way of looking at this, and maybe this is the way you're more used to seeing these sorts of uh, plastic traits is through reaction norms. So here are the two temperatures, room temperature and cold. These are the New York mice. These are the Brazil mice. Both show an effect of plasticity with shorter tails in the, uh, in the cold, but the effect is bigger for the Brazil mice. Their tails get, get much, much shorter. So that's interesting to us and suggests that at least some of the variation seen in natural populations may simply reflect uh, the temperature at which the mice uh, grew up. So uh, we're now looking at gene expression differences uh, in these mice reared at different temperatures to ask the question whether the expression networks that are changed uh, as a function of temperature are also those that are changed as, as a function of genotype when we compare the two, two genotypes. So that's where we were until about six months ago when a current student in the lab, Sylvia Durkin, came to me and said, well, Michael, what about maternal effects? And I said, what are you talking about? Um, maternal effects are well known for things like body size, but I can't imagine uh, that there are maternal effects on things like tail length. And she said, well, we haven't looked. I want to look. And I was convinced that this was crazy, but... Uh, being a good graduate student, she didn't listen to me too much. And she went ahead and did the experiment. And this is the experiment that she did. Uh, she did a reciprocal cross uh, between Brazil and New York mice. So uh, here we're looking at the tail length of uh, F1 offspring, where the mom is from Brazil. So remember, the Brazil mice have a longer tail. And this is the reciprocal cross F1 offspring where the mom is from New York with a short tail. And these reciprocal F1 offspring differ uh, in, in tail length in the direction of the mother. And I said, well, is this males or females? If it's males, it could be a sex chromosome effect. And she said, no, we see it in females. And in fact, what I'm showing you here is for uh, females. Um, and I said, well, it could be due to imprinting. It, it, it could be due to uh, a cytoplasmic nuclear uh, effect. Uh, I remain skeptical. I said, you know, the real test here is to cross foster these animals. And so she did that. Uh, and here are the same animals now cross fostered. So the same genotype is shown here, uh, but raised by a New York mother and the same genotype as here, but raised by, um, excuse me, yeah, that's right, raised by a, a Brazilian uh, mother. And what you can see is these cross-fostered pups uh, recapitulate the tail length of their, their mother. So this had us scratching our heads for a little while, and we knew that tail length depended on temperature. So uh, we thought, well, maybe the mothers uh, are simply uh, keeping their nests at different temperatures because they're more active or not spending as much time with the pups. So we decided to, 
measure nest temperature. And sure enough, we see this, uh, this difference. So Brazilian mothers are spending more time in the nest and keeping the nest temperature warmer uh, than New York mothers. So we think that this maternal effect is not mediated by things like lactation, which is sort of how we conventionally think of maternal effects, but might be mediated simply uh, by maternal behavior. And so now we're doing some behavioral studies to, uh, to assess that in, in more detail. But I, th I think that you know, the take home message here is that tail length uh, in mice is clearly determined by genes and the environment. And that environment includes not only the ambient environment, uh, but the maternal environment uh, as well. And so uh, we're starting to look at gene expression in all three situations to try to understand uh, the genes that are involved and how expression changes as a function uh, of, of these different situations. Okay, um, let me see. How am I doing on, uh, on time? Should I, I had, I was gonna talk about one more uh, little section. Should I, should I stop here or should I go? No, go please go ahead, go ahead. You sure? Okay. Um, so um, the, the very last thing I wanna talk about is this phenotype of water consumption. And we just noticed that uh, in comparing all of our lab strains, if we take mice from Arizona, they seem to drink much less water than mice from the other places. And so we thought, well, this is a nice model for thinking about uh, the, the genetics underlying adaptation to arid environments. And this was work done by a former graduate student, Noel Bittner. Uh, and the, the, the design we used was very similar to the last one. Uh, that is, we used a full sieve design uh, where we collected phenotypes in two different environments. And here the environments are unlimited water uh, and an environment where water is, is restricted. And the first thing we see is that mice from uh, Tucson, that is this arid environment, uh, lose less weight uh, under uh, when water is restricted than mice from an, uh, a wet environment. So they seem adapted to surviving uh, without water. When we look at gene expression in the, in the kidney, so here you can see the origin of the mice. Um, the mice from Tucson are in yellow, the mice from Edmonton are in green, and then the blue and white shows whether they're in the hydrated environment or the dehydrated environment. And the, the first thing you notice is that the gene expression differences uh, group first by population and secondly, by, by treatment. So there are big differences between population uh, uh, and then second, secondarily differences between treatments. And so we are interested uh, in comparing those differences. Uh, we see many genes are differentially expressed uh, and more genes are differentially expressed uh, between treatments in the mice from the wet environment, that is Edmonton, than the mice from the dry environment. Uh, as if the mice from the dry environment are already better adapted to this, this dry in environment. There's not as big of a plastic response under, under different treatments. So the, the question we were interested in uh, is whether on average, the expression differences between treatments uh, shown on the x-axis goes in the same direction or as the opposite direction uh, as the difference, the evolved difference between populations. And, and the answer is that by and large, uh, the expression changes under different treatments, but that is the plastic responses go in the same direction as the evolved responses. So this seems to be an example of adaptive uh, expression plasticity. And that, this is just another way of showing that more genes go in the same direction than, than in the opposite uh, direction. And this is an example of one of those genes. So uh, we can see if you just compare in a hydrated environment, uh, apolipoprotein E, which is known to be uh, importantly associated with kidney function, uh, the Tucson mice express it at a higher level than mice from this wet environment. Both kinds of mice, when you dehydrate them, turn up the expression of, of this gene. Uh, and in 
the Edmonton mice, they turn it up to what's basically the baseline level uh, in, the, in the Tucson mice. So we think that this is a, a key gene that might be associated with uh, adaptation to this very dry environment uh, and that we are able to identify by comparing patterns of expression plasticity with patterns of expression uh, ev evolution. Okay, um, I've left out a lot of details in the interest of time, but uh, tried to give you an overview of a, a number of uh, different studies and, and traits. Uh, and in all of this, what we're trying to do is link genotypes to specific environments. So I've shown you that mice have recently colonized new environments. And because we see similar patterns and across multiple uh, transects, uh, we think that these uh, differences are uh, uh, probably adaptive. So these replicated patterns, this is a sort of old way of looking for signals of selection. Famously, for example, in Drosophila melanogaster, you see clines that go in opposite directions in the two hemispheres, in the northern and the southern hemisphere. Uh, we see similar things now uh, in mice. And we think that this suggests that uh, many of these traits are adaptive and, and affect uh, fitness. Uh, body size and proportions uh, conform to well-known rules uh, uh, for traits associated with thermoregulation. But these traits uh, seem to be influenced by both genes and the environment. Uh, and in the cases I've shown you, the, uh, the plasticity seems to go in the same direction as the evolved differences. So we think that plasticity uh, in this case facilitates the colonization of the new environments. And then uh, patterns of gene expression, scans for selection, uh, and our mapping studies point to candidate genes of large effect for bo body size uh, and, and tail length. Uh, and both of these are, are complex traits. So uh, we think that we're starting to uh, scratch the surface of this very difficult problem uh, and begin to identify some uh, genes that might underlie uh, the kind of traits that we think are in fact most common uh, in, in evolution. Uh, and so stay tuned. I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of this in the years ahead uh, from lots, lots of labs uh, and hopefully in, in 10 years, we'll have a much more complete understanding of the genetic basis, not only of, of simple traits uh, that are adaptive, but of, of really uh, complex uh, traits. So I think I've already uh, acknowledged all of these uh, people as I went through the talk. Um, they, they do all the work and, and I get to sit here and tell you about it. Uh, so uh, I've been lucky to have a, a lab full of uh, great students and, and postdocs. I'm always on the lookout for good postdocs. So if you're interested, um, feel free to reach out to me and I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions either in the chat or however you like to do it by unmuting yourself. Thank you very much.